this is our first Impacts Hour for 2017, communication that counts. And I have three amazing guests today. I have Amy Braunschweiger, James Hanahan, mm -hmm. and Todd Gitlin. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them. And uh, for those of you live streaming, um, it is, uh, we're gonna try to take your questions and comments from Facebook, but this is also our first time streaming using the technology we have. So we're gonna try to get to your questions, but if we don't get to them, that's because we don't see them for some reason or another. So we're not ignoring you. Um, and obviously in person, feel free to just raise your hand anytime you want. Um, so I'm gonna just give a little intro to you guys so you can blush while I read all of your amazing accomplishments. Um, Amy Braunschweiger is the Senior Web Communications Manager at Human Rights Watch, where she works as a writer and an editor and is part of the team that oversees the organization's digital presence across its website, newsletters, social media, and just all over the place. Um, as a journalist, she's uh, appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, New York and Village Voice, among other publications. And her book, Taxi Confidential, The Life, Death, and 3 AM Revelations in New York City Cabs, which is a very fun read, um, is a collection of 3D New York's cab stories from the 70s to present day. And I know you had a lot of fun interviewing for that one. Um, and next year we have James Hanahan, who's a writer and a visual artist, and his most recent novel, Delicious Foods, won the Penn Faulkner Award, and that was last year or the year before now? I'm okay. losing track of time. Uh, 2016 20. was, the, was the year it was attached to. So it was, it was last year now. Um, and it was selected for the Barnes & Noble Discover Great New Writers Program, the New York Times and Washington Post's 100 Notable Book of 2015, and the finalist for the LA Times Book Prize in Fiction. Very impressive. And he teaches in the writing program at Pratt Institute, and has also been a contributor to The Village Voice from 92 to 2014, um, and has been published in many other great uh, publications. And then we have Todd Gitlin, um, who is an American writer, sociologist, communication scholar, novelist, poet, and a not very private intellectual. Um, he's the author of 16 books, including The Media Unlimited, Unlimited, How the Torrent of Images and Sounds Overwhelms Our Lives, and he is now a professor of journalism and sociology and chair of the PhD program of communications at Columbia. And um, you've been published, I think, everywhere, <laughs> many different places. Right? Yeah, you might have a sketchbook on the wall here or by the end of today as well. Um, so I could go on and on, but we obviously have pretty amazing people here. And thank you guys so much for agreeing to come and talk. So, um, I had asked you guys a question, uh, kind of in prepping for this, because I like to sometimes start with humbling moments, particularly when we're talking with experts. Um, and we're talking about communication and how, particularly when we're working in environmental and social justice work, which um, in some ways is becoming harder, in some ways it's always been difficult. Um, so with you guys, what have been some mistakes you've made in communications? And you shared a couple. Amy, you had some that are relating to the current president and um, personally and organizationally. Will you share those? Yeah, so um, I don't know how like, deep I can really go into them here, but I can say that we were not really prepared for the Trump administration just because when it comes to human rights, obviously you don't know what it's going to look like exactly until someone's elected, but you have a strategy in place to go forward for like every country that we work in. We work in about 80 countries around the world and you have memos and you have like ideas and plans and we were not ready. We had a press release and I forget what the headline for it was. It was like, you know, Trump should respect human rights. And then it was like radio silence and no plans. So it basically was a lot of weeks of scrambling, getting people on the same page with what we wanted to say, which is not easy to do when you're in a 400 person organization and everyone has their own advocacy, advocacy goals. And so it was just, it was endless. It was an endless, endless time. And I think we've probably all in terms of communication and particularly in organizations, but even in our personal lives, had issues like the more people in the room, yeah. the more perspectives, opinions, yeah. It, it can be difficult. Yeah, and if you're trying to keep things simple, 
it makes it very difficult. Which we'll definitely come back to yeah. in terms of communication. And James, you seem to have had also a communication issue recently that I think we've probably all experienced personally, something with Google Translate. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the website BuzzFeed um, asked a bunch of writers to write about the, hundred, the first 100 days of Trump's uh, administration. And I wrote back to them and rather facetiously said to them, uh, it was going to be a hundred words for each of them, right? So I wrote back to them somewhat facetiously saying, can the words all be fuck? And they were like, okay. We'll, we'll edit that out. We'll just edit beep. <laughs> oh, I didn't, I didn't know that we were No, we're saying, not. I mean. Okay. <laughs> because I might have to say. Maybe don't use too many. Of... I might have to say it again. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll come up with a hand I'll signal. I'll say, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll figure something out. Okay. Um, anyway, um, so to my surprise, they said yes. Um, and as I was, so I was making this, but they wanted it to be like different every time it, the, the iterations of <laughs> um, <laughs> appeared on the page. So I started doing it and then I decided I was going to like put some different uh, languages into it. And uh, so not knowing a ton of other languages, uh, I used Google Translate to, um, to translate what I thought was, you know, that expletive um, <laughs> a bunch of different times. I'm sure there are still mistakes on it. Um, but it turned out uh, someone who knows Arabic <laughs> told me that all of the Arabic was backwards. Oh, nice. Because, and I looked at it again, yeah. and, and uh, when you look at Google Translate and you move the, the uh, phrase back and forth, like when you, when you move it back one way, it just goes backwards and that's just how it works. So at least um, people had no idea what was going on, which was maybe what you were also trying to communicate. Yeah, it's like the world is backwards. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it was it was kind of embarrassing, and I know there are probably other mistakes because I you know I did it in other languages or what I thought were other languages. Um, but somebody very nicely um, pointed it out, and like he made these like. Things that I can put in, so it's I've I've corrected the, that mistake, yeah. but it was sort of. Well, I know I've off. I've done Google, I've seen I speak kind of speak some other languages, and I've done Google Translate a few times, and um, it's not the best. It's a good start, <laughs> but not the best. Yeah. And Todd, have you you had brought up an interesting example with um, about some of the things you've written about in terms of technology and the spread of the rampant spread of technology, as well as getting engaged in politics and there being an issue with you know translating the bigger ideas to personal actions. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, let me say something about politics, uh, which, uh, where I have to claim a, a, a very long-standing failure. Um, I'm a 60s guy. I did a lot of political work in the 1960s in what we call the New Left. And um, have been rethinking what I learned uh, ever since, and writing books about it and whatnot. And um, one of the conclusions I came to, in great pain, was that politics is a duty. That that word doesn't ring uh, beautifully today. We are in a post-duty culture in which we do what we feel like doing. Um, but I have been for a long time in particular trying to get people who have values that I think are worth instating in the world and enlarging upon, how to get them to understand that they have political duties. And that their political duty is not simply to say what comes to mind, it's not simply to express themselves, although we all like to do that, but that uh, there are things you have to do. When you get up in the morning, you brush your teeth. It's not maybe the most glorious activity, uh, but it is in our culture a necessity. So all this is by way of background to saying that now I have undergone several rounds of great failure trying to alert people who should know better that they needed to vote for President of the United States. Hmm. And uh, in 2000, I devoted quite a lot of energy to writing articles against uh, Ralph Nader vote. 
in many newspapers, in many online magazines. To every, anybody I could uh, grab by the ear, I uh, made what I thought were stupendously compelling arguments. Uh, obviously, I failed. Um, and uh, the world changed as a result, not, not just of my failure, but primarily of Ralph Nader's uh, overweening uh, self-aggrandizement. But um, the upshot was we got George W. Bush and the Iraq War, uh, and uh, a, a sum total of human suffering uh, that I'm incapable of counting to. Uh, and then, uh, so it happened that uh, the world turned in its various ways, and so came 2016, when I set out uh, to sort of remind people of the political alphabet, that there were duties to keep this dangerous, lunatic, narcissist, uh, ruffian uh, creep out of the White House. Uh, once again, obviously I and people of my disposition failed. Um, and um, I, I'll just leave it at that. I, I take these to be immense failures and uh, I don't know what to do about them except I, I cope now with the fact of their failure. That is, I'm obsessed with what we collectively face, whether we like it or not. Yeah, and I think a lot of people uh, feel that way, um, both with elections, but also with many other issues, particularly when we're dealing with issues, like we deal a lot with climate change, which is just this huge, overarching, overwhelming issue, and this idea of how do you um, engage people? How do you get people, because we're not taking enough action, whether it's politically or climate, or you know, we could make a long list of, of issues. Um, and one of the things why we're doing this series is one of the ideas that we have is that it really is a communications issue in a lot of, you know, stances that we're not quite reaching people for some reason. We're not, we have a lot of theories for why, but practically it's not, it's not happening to the level that we need it. So I think this, this leads what you're talking about, your examples, and thank you for being vulnerable from the get-go. I think it helps everyone else be a little vulnerable too. Um, and I'm going to go to that now, because in terms of communication, I want to play a little game with everyone, um, is what do you think, if you were to rate yourself as a communicator, one to ten, ten is like, you are 100%, you're, you're just like, you get, you get through 100% every time you're communicating, um, how would you rate yourself? And just think for a second, like, and for everyone, how would you honestly rate yourself from one to ten? Alright, I've got my number. And then, because we're going to expand it a little bit, how would you rate the mass media right now? And I'll put mass media in quotes, you know, just like the really big publications, the, you know, anyone. So what's their number compared to you? And then I'm going to just put in there, how about nonprofits? Number that comes up in your head. Um, and then like the person next to you, how are you going to rate them? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I want to ask, is anyone willing to share what they'd rate themselves for on communications? Anyone? And online, you can comment on the Facebook feed, and it is working right now, so I think I will see your comments and questions. How would you, James, you <laughs> look, the most, yeah, look the most perplexed, I'm not so really perplexed how would you rate just, yourself? Uh, two was the number. A two, uh, all right. Yeah. Well, well, I, mean, I love the humility. Well, no, it's not even really humility. I feel like I... I usually have to explain what I'm thinking to people um, for a variety of reasons. I mean, it used to be more frustrating to me because I thought I was being clear all of the time, but uh, it, it just seems that like my mind works in this way that people don't get immediately. I mean, it's one of the reasons I'm a writer, right? It's like, no, I, I can just write it down and rework it any number of times so that I can be sure that people know what I'm talking about, but like, too often it's like, <laughs> what did you, could you explain? And it's usually a joke or a pun or like some sexual innuendo. And, you know, I, used to, I actually had a friend who so often didn't understand what I was saying that I gave him a little like, like mnemonic guide to like utterances, oh, no. utterances that I might make. Like there was one that was IAP, it's a pun. <laughs> 
you know. And and Amy, how would you rate nonprofits in communication? Well, you know, I actually, being me, had more questions to answer your question with. So I'd be <laughs> like, who's your audience, and what do you want them to know? So I mean, is your audience the entire country? Are you trying to change people's minds and how like the average person does things? And I would actually say pretty low, like three. Is your audience like five policymakers in DC where you're actually knocking on their doors and like giving them something and talking with them? Then like that's good. And maybe like we're really able direct. to like it's really direct. And were you able to take them from like zero to like almost on your team in one conversation? Okay, that's pretty good. So it really for me is all about who do you want and what do you want them to do? And Todd, I'm going to explain, before I ask you a question, I'm going to explain a little bit why I asked this. You know, one thing that, that I've come across in different readings and also just working with different groups is that a lot of people tend to think that we're good at communicating, whether it's in our personal lives. Like, I know my husband knows exactly what I'm saying every time I say it. Um, and for those of you who know my husband, no, that's not true. Um, <laughs> And um, you know, and organizationally, where where we think, yeah, we're getting we're getting across, like they're hearing our, our message. And so, Todd, I wanted to ask your opinion on this idea of this that we think we're good at communicating, and how that might be a barrier to improving communication. Any thoughts on that? Well, I'm gonna have to go metaphysical. Here. All right, let's do it. So, <laughs> the, I think that conventionally. Uh, the conversation about communication is a conversation that involves two elements. So there's, there's I, who am trying to communicate to you. The I is better known than the you. Um, but I want to put forward the notion that the I is also a blur. That is, we don't know ourselves. We don't know ourselves what we want to say. And therefore, we find ourselves in situations where not only do we, are we uncertain of what happens after we utter some words, but we're not sure what we, quote unquote, have to say. And you, on the other hand, I, I, I don't know what it is you think you were communicating <laughs> a little while ago, because I thought you were uh, distinguishedly uh, uh, lucid. So, uh, so you must think it's much more an actual think, conversation than I, that this happens. Not okay. Not in a formal panel discussion. But you know, so to to, to flip here for a moment. So we we all of us are concerned in some way or other about climate change. So I think well maybe what it is to be communicated. Um, maybe the I who wants to communicate something about climate change is not quite as cut and dried as I normally think. Maybe I, maybe in some ways I don't know what I think and therefore I don't know what to communicate. I mean, I know some things, I mean, I know a bunch of things. I know enough to talk to students. I know enough to write articles. But maybe what I want to say is, or maybe what I want to say is so large and complicated and, uh, and painful that I, I don't really have words for what I really want to say. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, I, if we wanted to go on all day, I could tell you, <laughs> I, could, I could ramble and, and try to come to grips with what it is I really want to say. But it would take me a long time. I would have to fill a lot of space with words. It would be more like painting. And, and Amy would edit you, because that's what she does to me all the time. I, I, would, try to, I would edit myself. Yeah. It's um, a, sort of the opposite of the Dunning-Kruger effect, you know, the overconfidence that makes you think like you do things really well when in fact you're an underperformer. Hmm. Like, What's the Dunning-Kruger? The Dunning-Kruger effect, it's like um, the overconfidence in your ability, uh, even though you're operating in a low level. Uh, we have a lot of experience with it. Yeah, <laughs> well, apparently it's like what Americans are best at. Do you think Americans are, <laughs> no, some, are, there have been are studies better at it like, than others? Well, it's not that I think that. There are I mean, there some studies about yeah. how in, in school that's what Americans are good at, being really confident despite their low level of achievement. You know, it's yeah. interesting. Um, I, I spent a year in, teaching in France, and I met a, a French woman who would come to teach in an American college. 
Um, and she made the mistake of grading the students by the standards that she had been taught to apply. She was fired <laughs> because she was giving the students real grades and they couldn't bear it. She was mm -hmm. tossed out. You know, everybody's above average here in, right. in our country. And, and I think there, there are probably pros and cons. I've also, um, with grading, have had similar experiences, not being fired, but being told that things couldn't be under a certain grade for a particular program. Um, but I wanna, I wanna backtrack a little, because a lot of people are, are watching and are here to really, to actually get some tools for, so, so we've kind of laid out a lot of mistakes, a lot of things that we're not quite doing right, or even cultural, you know, and, and maybe a lot of these are based in cultural assumptions or um, just part of our culture, how we communicate, how we view ourselves. Um, but we had talked a little bit before this about what are some things in order to effectively get, understand the I that you were talking about and communicate to the you, whoever that you is, what are some of the must haves, if there are any, to do that? And Amy, I know that, that with a lot of help that you give our organization and being clear in communication, less wonky, if you know that term mm -hmm. of like, Speaking, you know, I could go into all of the acronyms of the UN and the UNF Triple C report and all this stuff on climate change. What are some must-haves that you see in terms of getting to a broader public of a we? Um, I'd say one is clarity, kind of like back to what you were just saying about how we don't always know what we want to say. It's like figure out what you want to say. We have researchers who write these really long hundred-page reports. I'm like, okay, give it to me in one line what's your report? And it stumps them, but if you can't tell somebody in one line, maybe you're also not clear yourself on what it is. You know, and so really just get clear on what it is and what you want people to do. Like, do you want people to do something? Just be very clear, tight, like, and this is, you know, I work in digital, so it's also different, but I also write very long pieces sometimes, and, but I would always say just, clear and tight from so, a digital perspective. And I want to do a follow-up and feel yeah. free to jump in because a lot of people I know in climate change, a lot, of, uh, a lot of conversation goes, well, people just need to understand it. They just need to know um, more. Yeah. But we've done these impact hours with climate communications experts and they say, actually, more facts like yeah. doesn't help. Um, and that's gonna, we're going to come back to that. But what's your thought on that? Like, because a lot of us, that tends to be a drive. You just don't yeah. understand me, Amy. Yeah. You need to understand me, and then you'll see. Exactly. No, um, we use stories a lot. So we find that facts are just easy to disregard, and they're also abstract. And it's like hard for people to like really hang on to them. But if you tell the story of like a woman, like we work on child marriage in Bangladesh, and climate change is really affecting it. So, but if you're a girl and you know you just tell the stories about well their father has farmland but then it was taken over by water and they can no longer afford to have kids so you've got to marry the daughters off fast and so you really interview this girl and you get like her perspective on what her life looks like now because she had to be married at like 13 it's much more compelling and i know bangladesh is a country just very far away which is another way that People have a hard time grabbing onto it, but just making it just as relatable as possible in a human level is something we really focus on. And um, James, you had talked about wording things carefully and compassionately. And I uh, wonder if you could expand on that. Uh, <laughs> or if you I changed mean, your mind. Well, no, 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 I haven't completely changed my mind, although um, one of the things I'm sort of uh, obsessed with about writing is, is intentionality. And the difference between, um, when you said the word clarity, I always think to myself, well, you know, clarity. Speak to your friends the way that you speak to a potential employer, right? So, like, there are all these different ways in which we, uh, we modulate our language um, in order to suit the, the specific situation that we're in. Um, and so that's, I think that's one of the things that's important to to do. I also think stories are very important. But then, you know, maybe the, the stories need to be closer to home sometimes. Like, one of the things that freaked me out, I was in Miami not that long ago, and I heard that, like, 
as soon as the water level rises to the point where it gets into their water system, they're fucked. Oh, yet again. <laughs> they're screwed. That's right. These are F-bomb uh, <laughs> panelists for the day. But, I mean, it's, it, I mean yeah. there's just no more Miami in yeah. the way that we knew it. I mean, maybe it'll be like Venice or something. I love people. how you're already talking in past tense. <laughs> Um, and, and that's, you know, two major things, so like simplicity and clarity, but making it personal and, and telling it through story. And, and Todd, you had brought up some issues, um, coming back again to something I think you brought up earlier about knowing your audience, and I think also with what Amy's points were, of knowing what your goals are. Do you have anything else to add? Well, yeah, actually I want to contradict myself. Okay, great. <laughs> um, because I agree about, I agree about clarity being good thing. Uh, I agree about knowing who you're talking to. Uh, and I agree that uh, uh, piling facts is not uh, a useful form of communication. However, another part of me wants to say about climate change in particular, hmm. this is an emergency. Now, I, I have no idea what you should do about it. I'm not really sure what I should do about it. But let's contemplate a situation like this. Uh, you have a small child. The small child runs out into the street. You don't know what's going to happen, and the odds that the child is going to be run over by a car may be low. But you recognize this situation without having to be lectured about it, that this is an emergency. So whatever you do now has to be commensurate with your recognition that this is an emergency. So, I, you know, I'm not sure what you should do. You have to size up the situation. You know where the cars are and so on. You know how your kid reacts when you call his name or her name. But um, let's just start by recognizing that you have to pull yourself out of the everyday. Now that, I think, is actually where we are with respect to climate change. Uh, we are very late in the game. I mean, I, mean, I could go on. You know, humanity's been at this for uh, more than two centuries. We've been... Um, Everything we've produced, everything we've learned to do, has thrown carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We thought that was free. It wasn't free. Now it, the due bills are coming home. Now, therefore, everything we understand, or a, a great deal of what we understand about the world is in jeopardy. When I was trying to convey something like this to a class a couple years ago, I started teaching a short book by a philosopher named Samuel Scheffler, um, and it's about the problem of posterity. What he raises is the following problem, and so much of what we value presupposes that there will be a posterity which will judge us, which we care about, which we are trying to uh, protect. And uh, so much of what we think is good we understand will not be understood as good today, but we think that it will be good insofar as someday people will recognize that what I did was good or bad or indifferent. So what happens if the rug of posterity is pulled out from under us? Now, this is wordy, but I'm going to prolong <laughs> it just one bit more. Okay. So one way, uh, if, I were having, if I were having a serious conversation, I would want to say to somebody who was denying the emergency, I would want to say, what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong about the ability of your child to survive the street that he's just dashed after? What are you wrong? What, what if you're wrong? I mean, I, I don't know that that's an effective form of communication, but it is an honest one, mm. because I think this is, this, uh, you know, it's, I think, elementary that we make all kinds of judgments, none of us is perfect, none of us is all-knowing, uh, but if we're grown up, we need to contemplate the possibility that we've been wrong. And if so, where are we? Yeah. And I'm gonna, because you've brought up a lot of points here, I do wanna, in, in a minute, I'm gonna get to this idea of if we actually do want people to take action, if that's one of the goals of our communications, with at least with the work we do around climate and other environmental issues and a lot working on justice, human rights issue, it's a call to action. It's trying to get all of you, all of us motivated. How that changes 
our perceptions of, of how to communicate. I want to get to that in a minute, so have it back here. But I also have a, um, a comment uh, that I wanted to bring up that I think is very relevant to the Times uh, from actually Katie in Berlin. And it's looking at the idea of, it seems that right now, if we often if we come up against someone that has different opinions on us, let's say on climate change or on policing, or you know, we can just, or on human rights. You know, I know sometimes you don't even bring up human rights in certain conversations. I don't bring up climate in every conversation, and I'll get to that later. But it, we seem to be in a time where having a different opinion on some of these issues or different sets of information um, on it stops the conversation. And so Katie had, had some questions and wanted to hear from you about that. How do we get past that? What are some ways to communicate beyond those walls of, oh, you don't, you don't like that, or you have a different opinion, or vote differently, it's done. Or is it worth our time to continue that conversation? What are your thoughts? Well, I have lots of thoughts. Yeah? Jump in. Yeah, because so I'm pretty liberal. Much of my family is not. Um, and I think what's key is not to judge the other person, because when they feel judged, they're automatically, like, automatically shut down. And... Even if they're judging you, like don't judge them. And like find a way to like have something in common. Once you have something in common, you can go from there. Um, I actually, in this, this respect, my mom is my idol. Like I remember one Christmas, like my cousin came home, it was after like the Sandy Hook massacre, and he was just like, teachers need guns. Like we need to give like teachers guns and go into the school room. And my mom's like, well, you know, I was a teacher and I just don't think that's going to like solve anything. And like, he's like, but you know, and like, and he was like argumentative and she's like, well, I just don't agree. And like, she just like very gently and compassionately with love, like talked to him. And then half an hour later, he was like, well, yeah, I guess you're right. And you know, and that, I think, was a really successful combination in conversation. <laughs> like, she took him from being here to being over here when it came to his opinion on the issue. <coughs> and she did it without judging him, without making him feel stupid, and, but also without sacrificing her own principles at the same time. So, so I have a feeling yeah. that there's some other comments. Can you drop a foot down there? Yeah, please. So when I was about 14 or 15, I decided when I grew up, I wanted to be Walt Whitman. And uh, for many reasons. Uh, one of them, uh, it of course began with Leaves of Grass. And then uh, somewhere along the line, I read his um, a book of prose um, called Democratic Vistas, in which, the, in which he's trying to define what he calls the, the great poet. And here's one thing he says about the great poet. He judges not as the judge judges, but as the sunlight falling around a helpless thing. And I have aspired to reach that notion of judgment and failed. <laughs> but I also, we learn a lot of failures. As a, as a goal. Yeah, exactly. And I'd like to add because another part of the comment was also, and this is something that we see a lot, particularly in climate communications, is that we're not always the best messenger for certain audiences. So, you know, I'm going to be the best messenger to the people that are closest in my life, because there's a level of trust already established there, where they're going to trust that, you know, I know where I'm getting my information, or agree, you know, that we're in a similar culture and similar views. So this idea also in terms of communications, depending on who you want to communicate to, knowing whether you're the right person to be communicating or not might be another yeah. side of it. Um, and that was maybe an example with your mother mm -hmm. as well. She was good, a good yeah. one to communicate with. Yeah. And James, I was wondering if you had something to add to this. Um, well, I mean, I'm just uh, somewhat, I mean, I'm, I feel kind of pessimistic about a lot of this because it just seems like your mother has to happen on such a large scale. Yeah. You know, hey, moms, like, it's Mother hey, Day Sunday. Mother Day. Get yeah. working. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean, I just, like, not everyone is receptive. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of hope is a huge problem. You know, you know, like, people just hope 
that it's not happening, specifically climate change, but in a lot of different situations that are, you know, about to go south, let's say, um, people will just hope that it's not going to be bad until the very last possible moment that they can hope that it's not going to be bad. So I'm going to push back on that because I would say hope is also an asset in terms of, you know, uh, pulling people, getting people to take action. Because a lot of times if you think, there's nothing I can do about it. Like you really have that feeling there's no hope, there's nothing I can do about it. We often shut off. We don't take action. So if our goal is to get people to take action, hope can be a wonderful tool as well. No? Well, yes. sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I, maybe it's a, it's about applying it as like maybe the way that you would put on gas at one point and take put the brakes on. Um, it's but it's just really difficult I think for to see such a long term thing in terms of one's own life until something really terrible happens that's very close to home. I mean, and Sandy, you know, was that for New York? For New York, yeah. and I mean, I don't I. I, perhaps I'm being too pessimistic, but like I just don't. I, I see people worrying about it every time you know they talk about the weather. Like if it's too hot, uh oh, climate change. If it's too cold, oh no, climate change. But then and weather and nothing. climate are different things. They're right. right. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, I know they they, yeah. they are right. But then what do you do with that? And we have a comment here. Uh, I, well, I saw a great question on the Facebook um, chat about. Um, what is the goal of the commu communication? Is it to change someone's mind? And I, I had a similar question um, with regards to the, the intention or, or, or different intentions maybe of communications on climate change. Uh, a, a simple example might be um, viewing things as an opportunity or maybe presenting, let's say there's an industrial or, or an economic advantage of like focusing on solar and wind and it's going to be like a boon for the economy that that that, that kind of maybe kind of almost circumvents a conversation about is it real is it not real you know you're talking to someone kind of in their language maybe ma matching a pattern that they're they're interested in economic prosperity for example yeah. right like is that how does that work with inside of the the larger question of like changing minds uh raising awareness raising uh Concern. Yeah. No, I think that's important. I mean, um, these days a lot of people who are, including powerful people, who are ambivalent about whether climate change is for real, uh, are convinced that it's their mission to make money. And many of them have discovered you can make money by building solar and wind and other renewable resource operations. Uh, so I don't really, if somebody's willing to invest in solar, I don't particularly care what they know or believe about climate change because there is a right thing they need to do. Also, um, sometimes you, different arguments in different settings, again, going back to, you know, there is no one size that fits all. So somebody did a study, a, a good study, that looked at how to try to jam up how to jam the interference that some people put up. So why do, don't conservatives, um, so-called, whether they actually are interested in conserving something is another question. <laughs> but, um, so conservatives uh, don't believe, or don't want to believe, that 99, 97% of climate scientists believe that global warming is real and has human causes, but they don't want to believe it. Why? So, some experiments. So you tell, suppose you tell these people, so the, the, it, it, suppose you tell, suppose you, you don't try to dispute the, the, their, their understanding of the trajectory of climate change. Suppose you simply uh, try to convince them that there's money to be made by changing an investment strategy. Well, uh, maybe that works because so because it addresses the reason why many conservatives don't want to take the question seriously. Because here's how they're reasoning, and it's not logical. They're reasoning, well, if I were to take climate change seriously, then I would have to call for government action, number one. 
number two, but I deplore government action. Therefore, three, I must deny the premise. So you have to jam that association, which is illogical. But you, you may be able to do it if you don't try to change their mind about climate change, but rather try to change their mind about what governments can do. Or even what business, I mean, or what say business? private sector yeah, solutions. Sure. And, you know, I think this comes back to some of what Amy was talking about, too, in terms of, make, you know, connecting it to their lives. Um, and this is something that we try to talk about a lot in terms of communication, is that, um, at least uh, very personally, I, I think we, we certainly need a couple tracks going on. We do need to change hearts and minds and beliefs of many people. That takes a long time. I mean, think of your own personal life. If someone else tries to change your belief, comes in, and even a stranger or an organization or a government comes in and tries to change your belief, think of like all the things in you that light up. That, you know, I know for me, I'm like, no, you know, I'm not going to do it. But we do need that, you know, long term we need that, but that takes a long time. So while we have groups and people working on that, which we certainly need, we also need the quick fix. We need you to get to the solutions as quickly as possible, because we do have this time issue that we're talking about. Oh, yeah. And I, I think we could, could throw in a lot of different issues where um, there is a time sensitive um, you know, impacts that, that are going to happen to people, so that we also need to get people to solutions. And a lot of that is through making it speaking their language, literally, and so not using Google Translate. <laughs> and <laughs> also in terms of getting it into solutions that make sense within their identity, perhaps. Um, and I want to follow up with that because one of the components, and we have about 15 more minutes, just so you guys know, and feel free to keep asking questions both online and here in person. Um, so we've heard a lot about alternative facts lately. And I'm excited to, to see James's response. <laughs> um, so how do we make sense of things if we are trying to get people to take action? And we are also simultaneously trying to, to change some minds or even just provide access to information. How do we know what information is the right one or is the one that we, we spread? Um, you know, how do we deal with this communication in this I'm going to call the age of alternative facts. And you want to start, James? Because oh, I know you have. Sometimes because I have a problem with that phrase. Yes. Like I just don't want to in to allow that to become the way that we define our age. I mean, I, and that's maybe all I should say about it because this is the internet, and you know, who knows how far it's going. So, I mean, that's it. That's really all I have to yeah. say about it. So you deny. I do not the existence of, 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 of alternative facts. Perfect place. Well, I'm going to say a word yeah. in, in, in behalf of poor uh, Kellyanne Conway. <laughs> uh, poor well, thing. I think she needs some support. So <laughs> I think this needs more. I, I think she was inarticulate, but I think this is what she meant. The world is very complicated and confusing. Um, I don't know everything. I know that doesn't sound a lot. No, no, but no, bear, no. bear with me. Bear with me. <laughs> this is my. It's an attempt at a version. Of okay. <laughs> so, um, so I look around the room, and there's certain things I notice, but there are other things I don't notice. Well, you might notice things that I don't notice. Uh, somebody walking by might notice still other things. Her facts are alternate to mine. Not that they displace mine. They're just different. And that doesn't mean any of us is lying. Well, any of us is mistaken. It just means we have perspective. You are being so generous. I'm yeah. just, well, I'm, I'm never, gonna, yeah, like, I'm well, see, I'm trying to insinuate myself. Do you know what my interpretation of that, that phrase is? <laughs> yeah. I want to keep my job. That is what she's saying. Um, well, <laughs> so, I'm not sure she's done so well at it. Really. I, I want to pull she's back better from... Well, from well, she's still got it. <laughs> I want to pull back from, from speaking of her job, but to the idea... I, I would say that that's more alternative perspective and perspectives and facts are not the same well thing. you know so, you all know the 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 the, the gestalt psychology uh diagram 
you look at it, you see the picture. Know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know it's okay, tell me about that. You, 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 yeah. could, I, you could draw it. Okay, I'm, tell me I'm about it. I'm to say you could draw. Okay, there's a, there's a certain sort of a diagram that if you look at it one way, uh, what you see is what looks like the profile of a witch. Ooh, yeah. And if you look at it another way, it looks like, I forget what else, something else. Mm -hmm. And they're both true. They're, they're, there's, I mean, they're both, at you. there's no way logically to decide, is this a picture of the profile of a witch or the other thing? Right. For, but for the millennials, a is it a blue or a gold dress? Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. But does one have to make a decision about the, the relative truth of one or the other? Can it not be both? At the same time. Oh, exactly. So right. that's why I want to say to somebody who says, well, you know, the climate scientists don't agree. You know, yes, there's one or two or three percent who don't agree. But, you know, if you're ignoring what 97 or 99 percent of a certain population of people who know their stuff are saying, then you're the one who's ignoring the alternative fact, that is, the ones that fly in the face of your prejudice. Mm -hmm. And Amy, you had said something about not repeating. Oh, yes. Yeah, which is, I think, a little bit of what we're, you're going with this, is that there are lots of alternative facts out there right now, and we don't want to spread them further. And we're an organization with big reach, and so what we're trying to present, if you could call it even a counter-argument, but we wouldn't even frame it that way, like, we do not repeat it. We do not want these to get further play. And we also try to change the whole idea. Like, we talk a lot right now about reframing and just not even approaching it from the same argument, but coming in from a totally different direction. Um, you know, sometimes it works better than others, but, you know, like a lot of the reframing done right now with deporting people who are undocumented or, you know, who have like committed crimes who are here with a green card or whatnot is we talk we try to talk more about families and tearing families apart are you like the main provider for a family with four kids and so i wouldn't call that the most successful reframing technique out there right now others have done like a lot better for us but it's like pick a whole new angle and come from there like you an were, angle that's your strength and james you were cringing a i was just, you know i was just i was just going to support you by saying like can we just call them lies <laughs> well yeah. really uh -huh. Yeah. The more the more that phrase gets around, the worse it gets for everybody. Well, then, so that, well, we end up redefining what fact means, right. which is, you know, linguistically, <laughs> is that really where we want to go? And so I would agree, we will not use that term anymore. <laughs> Just like we'll cens the censor your f bombs. Um, Can I give an example yes. of how not to frame things? Okay. Sure. Yeah, I was actually <laughs> that was my next experience? question. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you looked at the front page of the New York Times yesterday, you can see the exact. A replica of the letter from Donald J. Trump to James Comey firing him. Okay. First oh, paragraph yes. says, says uh, "I'm firing him." Second paragraph. <laughs> second paragraph says the following: While I greatly appreciate you informing me on three separate occasions that I am not under investigation. I nevertheless concur with the judgment of the Department of Justice that you were not able to effectively lead the Bureau. Now, let me read those words again. <laughs> While I greatly appreciate you informing me on three separate occasions that I am not under investigation. Who says something like that? I haven't beaten my wife. Thank you for noting that I haven't beaten my wife. <laughs> Is the, are these not the words of somebody who's beaten his wife? Why is he obsessed with whether he's under investigation? He has framed the issue so that if you don't understand that he is worried about appearances that he has a deal with Russians, if he weren't concerned about that, he wouldn't have brought it up because nobody else had. Okay. Yeah. There's a perfect example of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, you yeah. deny that you know that it's raining and people are getting out their umbrellas when you're insistent enough about it because they've come to understand that you don't know whether it's raining or not. Hmm. So, exactly right about not framing things the way the other guys are. Yeah. And we have 10 minutes left, so I want to make sure that we get questions and comments. Um, there was someone uh, that commented on Facebook that said, 
we also just really need to show solutions and give people a sense of efficacy, that they're having an impact. And I'm wondering if you guys have any ideas, again, kind of maybe trying in the last 10 minutes to get practical of like giving people tools of, you know, how do we actually do this? So it's great to talk about good communication, <laughs> hopefully communicating it well, but how do we actually implement it? Solar power works. And look at all the states and nations that are using it. Wind power works. And look at all the states and nations that are using it. And here are here's how much of their electricity they're now generating this way. And it's I would say even pushing further, depending on who you're talking to, if we want to go renewables, that solar is one of the bigger employers. You know, it's a growing sector that is employing more and more people, many more people than the coal industry that we're trying to save. Yeah. Um, and it's saving we, money. We are not trying to save, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and it's also saving money. So saving money. So there. So we can take again this one solution, and we can frame it in many different ways. We can say. Man, it's, uh, I know we were working with some tea partiers in Atlanta, and they love solar energy. It, a lot of them didn't believe in climate change, but they loved it because it was against monopolies, and it was energy independence. So there you go. Put solar on the house. Great. Or it's for jobs. Yeah, go ahead. Couldn't you also just say that, I did the math on this a while ago, so I'm not sure if it's still true, but you can take out a home equity loan and buy solar panels, and it would cost the same as your electricity bill, but you'd have to do electricity after five years. Yeah, so that's like return on investment. So you'll invest some, and there, at least right now, there's some tax credits. I don't know how long. Hurry, get your solar now. <laughs> how long they're going to last. Um, but yeah, after a while, then suddenly you don't have electricity bills. But that's something know. that a person can do themselves rather than larger concepts or... Yeah, so you see the impact straight away. So are there other, and this doesn't have to be climate related, but just on this idea of like how to package solutions. I mean, we do a lot of work on this. It's same, but different. So I work on the digital team and we're like a huge advocacy organization. And so when we have a big issue, we might have different audiences. And so for example, um, right now there's like a Saudi led bombing campaign going on in Yemen. And we really wanted like the US to stop arming Saudi, except like civilians being killed in Yemen. And while it was completely completely successful, like we had a campaign going, which was like a, you know, call your senator type of thing. And so and people did. And we actually went and we also had high level advocacy going at the same time, which is basically knocking on the senator's door and being like, Oh, are you noticing you're getting like all of these phone calls and things in your inbox? Well, you know, the time has come, please listen to us. And while they didn't actually stop arming Saudi Arabia, they really considered it. And that was much further than we thought that we were ever going to get. And it was these two types of advocacy working together. So one, it was like really streamlining the message, one to make the average person care and want to like do something with a totally, you know, different, more sophisticated message to like people in DC. But then at the end, like you let people know what happened. Like you send out another email to everyone who did that and was like, thank you. You know, like it didn't stop, but people considered it. Like this is actually a big deal. More people are aware of it now, next time. And, and I so, think that's something yeah. we can do as individuals of like, well, you coming out to join me on this activity affected me personally, you know, really made my day. You know, that can, on a personal level, do it, but organizationally, certainly that follow-up on letting people know that what you did, even if there isn't the, the ultimate, you know, goal wasn't fulfilled, that you yeah. took some steps that way. matter. And what else? What are other ways? Do you have other examples or ideas for packaging solutions in, in more effective ways or giving people a sense of efficacy? Well, I think one of the things we've been sort of um, uh, getting toward is, is the idea that moral imperatives are not as appealing to people, especially if their beliefs are different than yours, than say, you know, financial, economic sort of incentives, or um, even just like the idea that somebody is having a, a great time, like somewhere where you're not, and you need to get over there. Better get to that protest. Yeah, it's I so mean, much it's, fun. Uh, yeah, essentially. <laughs>
all the cool people are there. <laughs> I mean, well, whatever it takes. But that's, that's again, knowing your audience, because I know that some um, people that are working a lot in climate change and faith communities, a moral imperative might be a very effective communications tool. So again, knowing, and not, not in your community, apparently not, <laughs> not in your, in your, in your uh, yeah, But there are people community. who know those people, yeah. Yeah. and who are working yeah. doing their damnedest. To but that's, again, comes back to your idea of knowing your eye, and, and also what role we're going to play most effectively. Like, I'm not going to be the most effective communicator for evangelicals. It's just, it's not my community. I don't know, you know, the priorities. I can assume some, but I'm not the messenger. Um, I am a bleeding heart liberal from the Northeast, you know. <laughs> I wear it on my sleeve. Um, and Todd, I was wondering if you, we have a few more minutes, but do you have any thoughts on this? Um, giving efficacy, helping people? I try a lot of things and see what works. I mean, I'm an empiricist. I, I don't know that much. I want to try this or that. Trial and error, trial and error, 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 <laughs> something. No, really, I mean, we're talking yeah. about long processes. We're talking, you know, it is an emergency, but it's not an emergency that's gonna be resolved within the next year. So uh, if we're lucky, we have long lives and we could try this and that and learn from our experience. Yeah. But the child is in the street. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> go the hell out and get the child. Yeah, <laughs> go grab the kid. Um, any last, for people here in the audience, any last questions or comments? Other than size? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, it's really disheartening with the Paris Climate Accord and, and Trump pulling out of it. He hasn't. Well, he... he just took down the promise of getting out of it from his to-do list on his website mm -hmm. today. Well, maybe we can thank oh. Ivanka for something. Yeah, I wonder what that's... That's number one. Number two, you know, whether you're in the Paris Agreement or not, you haven't solved the problem. The problem goes on. So yeah, Paris is, was important, and it's important for the United States to be in it. But it's not all important. I think one thing that we're step though, yeah. it's a massive step. It's a, it is a massive step. There. Yeah, and, and in the meantime, the state of California and the state of New York and other states abutting them are acting as though we're part of Paris, and that will have a very big impact. You know, so. If you've had enough of the United States of America, you can secede and join the United States of the coasts, <laughs> where we actually know some science. <clears throat> yeah. Well, um, I, I would say that that's something um, in terms of having worked in environmental and particularly climate issues for a long time is we're not new to not having the U.S. government behind us. Mm -hmm. Like Obama was a new thing with having him supporting, and not all the way, supporting climate action. Um, so that was new. We got used to it quickly and loved it. Um, but we, there are so many solutions that don't depend on the federal government. On a global scale, it's certainly, in terms of messaging, it doesn't look very nice. But it also could be an activator. If suddenly people are saying, oh, we're not, out of, we're not doing that anymore, we are now responsible. We have to get going mm -hmm. on it. So I'm always the one to add the hope in there. <laughs> um, we have one minute left, and I want to thank all of you. We can obviously here keep talking, but I want to thank you so much for being a part of this first experiment. I think it was a fun conversation. And um, yeah, thank you so much thank for being here. Thank you for convening us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs> all right.